بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على حبيب الله سيدنا ومولانا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر صدق الله العظيم The tajalliyat of Allah Ta'ala The tajalliyat referring to the blessings of Allah And His special divine mercy that comes down Sometimes it's attached to place Sometimes it is attached to time So Sometimes it's attached to time Sometimes it's attached to place For example the Haramain Sharifain. You go to Baytullah, you go to Makkah, you go to Medina. At any time of the year you go, you will constantly feel certain blessings of Allah Ta'ala coming down. Anyone who has ever gone to Haram at any time during the year, at any moment in time you go there, you sit in front of the house of Allah Ta'ala and you can feel the tajalliyat, you can feel the blessings of Allah Ta'ala just showering. It's a sight to behold, it's an experience that nothing can come second to it. You go to Medina Munawwara and you sit in Masjid al-Nabawi, you sit in the Prophet's mosque, and the kind of sukoon, the kind of tranquility that descends in your heart, I doubt that there's any other place in the world that you will be able to feel something like that. Anyone who's experienced it knows it. Anyone who's ever experienced it can knows what I'm talking about. And anyone who hasn't, I pray that Allah Ta'ala give you the opportunity to go. And for those who've been there, I pray Allah Ta'ala gives us the opportunity to go again and again and again. And sometimes the blessings of Allah Ta'ala, this special mercy comes down or it's attached to, to time. Like in the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, we've all experienced there's a, a, there's a type of blessing. There's a type of tranquility that also descends. You fast the whole month. By the time Eid comes, there's a, there's a feeling that you, you have. Likewise, these... 10 days, these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, we find that the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned a great deal about them. In fact, these are from the, the days of Hajj in the sense that anyone who intends to go for Hajj, they can actually begin their intention right after Ramadan. If they wish, they can begin their ihram, they can put on the ihram right after the day of Eid, Eid al-Fitr. So right from the beginning of, of, of Shawwal, you can start your intention of Hajj, though the specific actions of Hajj will be performed in these particular days, starting from, uh, uh, from the days of Mina. So from the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, the hujjaj start to go out to Mina. The main integral element of Hajj is the day of Arafah, which is on the 9th. And then the 10th, from the 10th, they have the opportunity to do the tawaf al ziyara and so on. But for those of us who don't go, who aren't going for Hajj, nonetheless, these 10 days hold a great amount of reward and blessing. Now we're almost to the end of these 10 days. Today is the 8th, tomorrow will be the 9th. And Sunday is the day of Eid. But just for us to just get an understanding, because we still have an opportunity. Whatever time we have left, we still have an opportunity to get whatever we can. And it's, it's strange, you know, that when it comes to material, to, to um, uh, material gain, and material profit, our minds work in a way that sometimes they don't work in anywhere else. 
For example, when you hear there's a sale somewhere, you hear that it's Black Friday. You know the best deals. You know where to go, you know what to look for. And people are waiting in line at stores from before midnight. Right? If the, if the sale is going to be on Friday, you see there's a line. People you know, sitting there with tents. Hours, hours before, 4 a.m., 3 a.m., you have people waiting there. Why? Because you know. You know that there's a deal that I'm about to get, which I'm not going to get at any other time in the year. I need to buy a laptop, I need to buy a tablet. This is the, this is the time. But subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa mentions, for example, about these 10 days. There are no days in which any good action is done that is more beloved to Allah Ta'ala than these 10 days. Than these 10 days. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, So, engage. Engage in doing the remembrance of Allah, glorifying Allah, praising Allah Ta'ala. In another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, يَا عَضِلُ الصِّيَامُ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِّنْهَا بِصِّيَامِ سَنَةٍ وَقِيَامُ كُلِّ لَيْلَةٍ مِّنْهَا بِقِيَامِ لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ رواه الترمذي That a fast of one of these days is equal to a year. And standing at night in prayer is equal to Laylatul Qadr. Narrated by Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah. Fasting one of these ten days, and by ten we mean the first nine, because the tenth day is the day of Eid, and you're not allowed to fast on the day of Eid. So the first nine, fasting on these days is equal to the fast of one year. One year. And praying at night, standing in night in prayer, is equal to Laylatul Qadr. Now we still have, if you didn't fast today, you have an opportunity to fast tomorrow. Tomorrow is Yawm Arafah. And you have the opportunity tonight to spend some time in worship, in prayer at night. Subhanallah, this is the Prophet wasallam who has a direct connection from Allah Ta'ala. Which by the way, I want to kind of, I guess, go on a tangent here, but you have to recognize that when you hear about these rewards, whether it's related to Ramadan, whether it's related to you know, these 10 days, or whether it's related to the uh, uh, night prayer, or whatever it may be. right? It comes in a hadith that when a person prays tahajjud at night, that the mercy of Allah Ta'ala is the closest at that time. And Allah Ta'ala declares, is there anyone who wants rizq that I may give him rizq? Is there anyone who seeks my forgiveness that I forgive him? and about fasting and about all of these things, whatever the Prophet ﷺ said, recognize that he is the messenger of Allah. He has a direct connection with Allah Ta'ala. He's informing you about things that you and I do not have access to. Similarly, when the Prophet ﷺ tells us about death, or when the Prophet ﷺ tells us about paradise, or about hell, or what will happen after death, what will happen in the grave. These are things that you cannot simply, this is not knowledge and information that you can simply acquire through your senses. They're not related to empirical sciences. They're not related to, you know, testing a hypothesis, and coming up with a conclusion. This is information that's coming to you from wahi. The Prophet ﷺ has a direct access to Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala informs him of these things. Nabi Wasallam then tells the Ummah about these things. If for example, the Prophet ﷺ says that after a person dies, this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen. Or on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, this will happen. For example, it comes in a hadith, I believe in Tirmidhi, that on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the sun will be so close, تُدْنَ الشَّمْسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ It will be so close, that perhaps it will be a distance of a mile. And the narrator says, I don't know what is meant by a mile. Because in Arabic, the word meal could be used for 
the distance of, of a mile or meal is also used for the stick that's used in, in a bottle of, of kuhl or like for example an itar bottle the stick that you have that you use that's also called meal and so the rawi says I don't know what was meant by meal is it meant by a meal a mile or the distance of that small stick and on that day, Nabi also mentions that a person will sweat some according based on their sins. Some will be sweating to their ankles, some to their waist, some to their, their chest, some will be drowning in their sweat. And on that day, there will be no shade except for the shade of Allah's throne. Seven individuals, seven categories of individuals will find shade under the throne of Allah Ta'ala. And Nabi Sallallahu begins to list those seven individuals. The point I'm trying to make is, these things, we, there's no way we could have access to that information. This is a favor of Allah Ta'ala on us, that Allah Ta'ala through the Messenger of Allah, through the Messenger of Allah Ta'ala informs these things to us. Same thing, the reward of these things. You may not see the effect of that. You may not see the reward of that in this world. But if the Prophet wasallam, As-Sadiq Al-Masduq, the one who spoke in the truth and who only speaks the truth, if he's told you this information, then there's no doubt about it. There's no reason to doubt it. Now you may not see it in this world, you'll see it in the hereafter. A reward of this action will be like this, or the reward of that action will be like that or the punishment of this type of sin is like this, or the punishment of that sin is like that. You may not see it in this world, though there always affects any good deed that a person does, any good deed a person does, there's always an effect of that good deed. Either you'll see it in yourself, you'll see it around you, you'll see it in your children, and any time a sin is committed, there's also an effect of that sin. Whether it's related to you, or whether it's related to your family, or your wealth, whatever it may be, there's always some sort of effect. For example, Allah Ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Kahf, that when Musa السلام, and Khadr السلام, were, were going, one of the things that Khadr السلام, did was, he chose to reconstruct a wall that was built. And Musa السلام, asked him why? And one of the things that Khadr السلام, had told him was, you're not allowed to ask me any questions. You're not allowed to object to anything I do. You're not allowed to ask any questions. And so this was the last and final straw. And he said, look, هذا فراق بيني وبينك. This is it. This was the last opportunity you had. You asked. And let me tell you why I did what I did. And when it came to the explanation of why he reconstructed that wall, he said, that underneath it, there is some wealth that's buried. There's a righteous man, he passed away, and he left behind some orphans, and that wealth belongs to those orphans. And in the city that we went to, had this wall fallen, had the wall fallen, then the wealth would have become uncovered, and they would have taken it. And they wouldn't have given it to the orphans. But these orphans, when they grow up, they'll find out, and they'll take what belongs to them, what's their right. And over there, what did Khadr السلام, say? كَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا وَيَسْتَخْرِجَ كَنْزَهُمَا رَحْمَةً مِّنْ رَبِّكَ That their father was righteous, their father was pious. And because their father was pious, we decided to take care of these children. Your actions do have an impact. Either they will affect you, they will affect your children, they may affect your wealth. Sometimes you're not able to see it. Sometimes Allah Ta'ala reserves those effects for the hereafter. So now going back. These actions, these things that the Prophet Sallallahu said, this is Sahibul Wahi, an individual who has access to information from Allah Ta'ala, he's informing you. That if these 10 days hold this type, of bene this type of reward, then they definitely hold this type of reward. And when you do whatever action you do, do it with the certainty that I will get reward from Allah Ta'ala. Don't do it thinking, maybe I get the reward, maybe I don't get the reward. When you do any action, do it with this yaqeen, with the certainty in mind that I will get the reward for it.
I hope and I expect reward from Allah Ta'ala for it. When it comes to, for example, the fasting and, and prayer regarding Ramadan, Nabi Sallallahu had mentioned at that time, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ أَوْ مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا You expect reward from it. Whenever you do any action, expect, Ya Allah, I'm doing this action for your sake. And Ya Allah, I expect reward for this. I hope for reward for this. Not that, and, and we ask Allah then, Ya Allah, please give me reward for this. Ya Allah, through this action, forgive my sins. Ya Allah, through this action, give me reward. Ya Allah, through this action, allow me to enter into paradise. Make that dua. Don't be like, Ya Allah, Nabi also mentioned this in a narration. He said, when you do an action, or when you make dua, don't make dua like, Ya Allah, if you want to forgive me, then forgive me. Ya Allah, if you don't want, don't make dua like that. Make dua with, with, with determination. Ya Allah, forgive me. I want your forgiveness. And do actions that show you want Allah's mercy and Allah's forgiveness. There are people who do certain acts, who, who just hope from Allah Ta'ala. Nabi Sallallahu said, الْكَيِّسُ مَنْ دَانَ نَفْسَهُ وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ That the intelligent individual is he who subdues his, his, his nafs, his desires, and he works for the hereafter. وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ He works for the life that's going to come after death. وَالْعَاجِزُ مَنْ أَتْبَعَ نَفْسَهُ هَوَاهَا وَتَمَنَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ And the foolish individual is he who continues to follow his desires. Man atba'a nafsa. He continues to follow his desires. Wa tamanna ala Allah. And he has this false hope, and this false sense of security. Oh, Allah, Allah will forgive me. Allah will forgive me. What did you do to deserve the mercy of Allah Ta'ala? Make dua to Allah. Ya Allah, I, I want your mercy. I want your forgiveness. I want your paradise. And do actions that show that you want Allah's mercy. And you want Allah's forgiveness. These are opportunities given to us by Allah Ta'ala. These are opportunities from Allah Ta'ala where a small amount of action that you do is given so much reward. One day of fasting equivalent to one year. Standing up at night for, for a moment, for two rakats. You can't stand for ten rakats, no problem. Wake up for two rakats. Two rakats in the middle of the night. And Nabi Sallallahu is saying what? It's equivalent to, to waking up on your Laylatul Qadr. Likewise now, with the day of Eid coming, the greatest action that Nabi Wasallam taught us on the day of Eid, for anyone who's able to, is to sacrifice an animal. Udhiyah. If you are able to, one who has the financial means, then go ahead and with your own hands, sacrifice an animal. In a hadith, the Prophet Wasallam said, مَا عَمِلَ آدْمِيٌّ مِّنْ عَمَلٍ يَوْمَ النَّحْرِ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ إِهْرَاقِ الدَّمْ there's no action on that day, on the day of Eid, that is more beloved to Allah Ta'ala than sacrificing an animal. Right? Because you're doing it all for the sake of Allah Ta'ala. You're doing it all at the order of Allah Ta'ala. That's the key element here. You look at the, the actions of Hajj, or you look at any other actions. What's the key thing that Allah Ta'ala is looking from you? Are you submitting yourself to Allah or not? He's the one who created you. Are you submitting yourself to Allah or not? Somebody can say, well, what's the point? What's the point of sacrificing? Or you look at the different actions, the various actions of Hajj. You're going from Mina to, to, to Arafah, then from Arafah you're going to Muzdalifah, and then from Muzdalifah you come back, you have to do Tawaf Ziyarah, you have to go around the Kaaba. So, what, is there any logic behind it? There is no need for logic. The idea is Allah commanded, we do it. Allah commanded, we do it. That's the point. Why is it that these actions, why is it that the stories of the Prophets والسلام, are there in the Qur'an forever until eternity? The story of Ibrahim السلام, and the sacrifices that he made, it was what? All of them are a representation of his sacrifice and his submission to Allah Ta'ala. We don't ask, why, why, why do I do this? Why, why do you do that? Why do I have to go from Mina to Arafah and from Arafah to Muzdalifah from there to there on the days of Hajj? Why do I have to sacrifice an, an animal? Uh, Allah Ta'ala commanded. It's a taqwa, it's a submission. It's the idea that I don't prostrate to anyone. 
I don't do sajda to anyone except Allah Ta'ala. And this one sajda saves me and protects me from doing sajda to anyone else. That's the idea, it's a submission. My grandfather, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, very often he used to say at the end of uh, prayer, after he would be done with prayer, he would quote uh, Allama Iqbal. And one of the lines that he used to say very often, just listening to him quite often, I ended up memorizing it was, Ye ek sajda jise tu gira samajta hai, hazar sajdo se tujhe najat deta hai. This one sajda that you consider insignificant, this one sajda, this one prostration which you consider insignificant saves you and protects you from bowing down to a thousand false idols. It's one sajda. What's the idea? Is submission. We are creation of Allah. We are created by Allah Ta'ala. Whatever Allah Ta'ala, He says do this, we do it. He says do that, we do it. So then on the day of Eid, make the intention. If you didn't make the intention already, make the intention on Yawmul Eid. If you have the financial ability, after the Eid prayer, after you're done performing the Eid prayer, then go and sacrifice with your own hand an animal. Nabi Sallallahu says, لَا يَقَعُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّ الدَّمَ لَا يَقَعُ مِنَ اللَّهِ بِمَكَانٍ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَقَعَ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ That before the, the blood hits the earth, Allah Ta'ala forgives the person already. Allah Ta'ala forgives the person before the blood of the animal hits the ground. And why? Why is that? It's because he demonstrated what I submitted to you, Ya Allah. I submit to you, Ya Allah. إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah Ta'ala give us the tawfiq insha'Allah. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.